go ahead and get started. Thank you all so much for coming. I think, I think you have a big fan base, or you're giving lots of extra credit. <laughs> but thank you all for coming. Thank you for showing up on time. I'm Jody, and uh, I'm one of the librarians, and I, I lead our one book program on campus, and today's talk is part of that series. Um, and in case you don't know what the one book program is, each year we choose a book or a pair in the books that talk about um, current issues impacting our society. And um, this year, we're focusing on immigration and borders and um, access to success in this country, access to being, to being able to stay in this country. Um, and we're using two books to talk about it. The first one is called Paper Stories uh, by Undocumented Youth. Uh, this comes out of Portland, and the, actually this came out of a film that was the first step toward it, a documentary film. And it's an analysis of um, DACA and undocumented youth, youth who are brought to this country's children and have been raised in this country and don't have legal status. Um, and anyway, so they turned it into a book. They're coming to campus November 4th from 2 to 4 in the afternoon. And please join us. It'll be over in the Grand Hall. They'll be showing their film, and then we'll have a panel discussion and Q&A with the filmmaker and four uh, undocumented youth leaders from the Northwest. And by the way, you can get a free copy of this book if your students uh, over at our library. And then Behold the Dreamers is our other book uh, by a Cameroonian-American author, Mbolo Um it's a, it's a really good read, um, and it's a talk about an immigrant family and their struggle to make it in this country. It's very relatable, um, and uh, yeah, I highly recommend it. And again, you can get a copy of this if you're interested. Um, I brought a few other, some fly, uh, a stack of flyers for some more events this fall. We have two more of these talks. Uh, November 14th, Francophone Heritage, African Voices and U.S. Immigration. And that'll be with Lisa Lugando, one of our French faculty members, and then a few guests. Um, and they'll be talking about, you know, what's it like to lose your home language and culture and identity? What's it like to translate into another culture? And then the, on December 5th, we'll have a couple of our English faculty members, Mike Moreno and Nina Pitzer. And they'll be presenting a talk called Intersecting Borders and Bridges, Mobility is Home in 21st Century Literature. And then again, on November 4th, we have our film screening for papers and that Q&A. So thank you all for coming so much. There are sign-in sheets going around. Um, they have faculty names on the top of them, except for the one that doesn't have a faculty name that's kind of for everybody else. Write your name on there and your teacher's last name, and we'll get it to that faculty member. And again, I'm happy to introduce, for those of you who don't know, Rebecca Ferrer. Thank you. How's everyone doing? Good, good. I know you're not hopefully too sad to be inside on a rainy day. Um, so thank you all for coming today, whatever your motivations were. But today I'm going to talk to you about um, a series of papers that I assign in my uh, environmental ethics class as they relate to the themes of the one book series that Jody has just laid out for you. Specifically, um, these papers address the ethical question of whether or not we have any obligations Right? If we are in a position where we have more than we need, right? do we have obligations to those who do not have enough? And specifically as it relates to national wealth and well-being, right? do wealthier nations have any obligations to those nations which might be struggling in some way or another? So we're first going to look at a paper by Garrett Hardin, uh, or I'm gonna talk to you about a paper by Garrett Hardin, and he's going to make the case that we do not owe anything to other nations. Right, who might be in need. Um, and then we're going to look at a series of critiques by two other authors who talk about some problems with the way Hardin frames the question. And so I'm gonna set up the problem for you first and go over uh, the choices that we uh, might have in this sort of dilemma. I'm gonna let you kind of come to your own conclusions first and then we'll dive into what the authors think. All right, so just a little bit of background um, so that we're all on the same page. By developed nation, I mean a designation for a country or a group of countries that enjoy the following. Typically, a developed nation would enjoy higher per capita income or higher average income per citizen, higher standards of living, which correspond to both the quality of goods available as well as the quantity of those goods. Uh, typically, it's correlated to longer life expectancies, 
as well as other levels of socioeconomic prosperity, especially as they relate to industrialization of an economy, as well as lower levels of political corruption. Now, you'll notice that I'm going to say things like higher and lower, right? Because right, it's all going to be relative to the standard of living and the way people are doing in other parts of the world, right? There is no country that is just at the bottom, right? And no country that is just at the top. But this at least can give us a way of maybe comparing right, the quality of life that we see in certain parts of the world over others. So in this chart over here, you can see by color the uh, countries that have been designated by various organizations, including um, uh, the United Nations, as the more advanced right, or developed nations. We have those in purple over here. And then we have those nations which are in transition from developing to developed. And then we have um, the orange and yellow being the less or least developed nations. So is there anything right off the bat that we notice about the proportion of developed nations to developing nations? There's more developed than developing nations. Is that what we see on this map? It's actually the opposite. So we actually have more countries that would be labeled as developing than as developed. And it might be thrown, right, because we've got some big ones over here, right? so it takes up a big part of the map. But in actuality, if we're looking at the number of countries, most countries would be labeled as developing rather than developed. Right? So how does this relate to um, right, the papers that we're going to be looking at? Well, just to give you a basic idea, um, when we're talking about resources that are available to people on the planet, we have to talk about what resources um, we can actually give people right, before we run out. Right? So hopefully you all know the difference between renewable and non-renewable resources. Anyone have no idea what I'm talking about there? No? Right? So the idea is that many of the resources that we use to survive are what? Renewable or non-renewable? Non-renewable. Right, which means that there is a finite amount of them, right? And the idea is that they will, it will not last people forever, okay? And there's a question of whether or not we even have enough resources to take care of the people who are on the planet now, let alone future generations of people, okay? So perhaps you've heard this conversation usually around the conversation of overpopulation, but it also works with respect to nations and their relationship to each other, right? Does one nation have enough resources to share Right, with those outside of their nation, right? Do they have enough to sustain all of those individuals, right? Is there enough land? So typically, we use certain calculus uh, or uh, various me uh, mechanisms of measurement to figure out how many resources an individual person needs. And this PowerPoint, I believe, is going to be made available on the, the one book in, in the library website. So if you're interested, I put a little link in here if you would like to figure out what your calculator is of how many resources you would need, right, given the way you use resources. And just to give you a little bit of an idea, um, I did this calculator for myself a couple years ago. Um, I was vegan at the time, uh, driving a, a, a very fuel-efficient vehicle, but I still was using so many resources as an American, right, based on our standard of living. I was using so many resources that if every single person in the world lived like I did, we would need three Earths, right? <laughs> How many Earths do we have? <laughs> One, <laughs> right? So the idea is, right, trying to figure out how many resources each person would need, but also, what would it take if everyone lived the way that we live in developed nations, right? So that's gonna play out in this conversation as well. All right, so now let's move on to uh, Garrett Hardin, who is the first, first author I mentioned. He puts forth um, a scenario that is going to help us figure out, according to him, whether or not we have obligations as members of a developed nation. Hint, hint, wink, wink, the United States is a developed nation, right? So we are a developed nation. So do we have obligations to people outside of the United States in developing nations? Now, um, I'll give you a little spoiler, right? He is going to claim that people in wealthier nations do not have an obligation to help those who are worse off in other nations. And relating to the topic of immigration, he specifically thinks that not only do we not owe them anything in their country, we should not let them into our country. 
right? So we can see how this conversation is going to be directly related to the themes that we're talking about with the one book series. But in order to get us to this conclusion, he gives us a metaphor, right? A way of representing this idea that sort of takes out some of the variables, right? That will help us figure out how we should respond. And the metaphor is called the lifeboat scenario, right? So this is typically referred to as lifeboat ethics. Okay, so the idea is this. Imagine a situation in which there are some people in the lifeboat, and then there are lots of people drowning in the water, right? So this metaphor is supposed to be that the people in the lifeboat are the richer people from developed nations, and the people drowning in the water are those who are from developing nations. So where would we be, in the lifeboat or in the water? In the lifeboat, okay, we are in the lifeboat. Now, in talking about how much of the population is in the lifeboat versus in the water, given the number of nations that are considered developing, 90% of the population in this scenario would be in the water, okay? So only 10% of the population was count, would count as well enough to be in the lifeboat. If you want to think of it in terms of numbers, imagine 10 people in the lifeboat, 90 people in the water. Okay. All right, so the ethical question is this. If you are in the lifeboat, right, and you only have a finite amount of resources in that lifeboat, okay, how should we respond to the drowning people in the water? Okay. Garrett Hardin is going to give us three choices, but before we talk about which choice is the right one, we also have to talk about what the consequences of each of those would be. So the first choice is this. We could be charitable to everyone. We could let all 90 people drowning in the water come onto the lifeboat. What do you think would happen if we were to do that? Capsize. If we let, sorry? The lifeboat would capsize. The lifeboat would capsize. We might run out of resources. And so what's going to happen to all of us? Okay. We're all going to die, OK? So according to Hardin, if we choose to be charitable to everyone, right, we will all perish. Right? So the next choice is to merely be charitable to some people. What would be the consequence of this? If we only let some people from the water into our boat, but not others? Good. And do you think that there is a good way we could determine who to let in the lifeboat and who not to let in the lifeboat? Uh, yeah, people that are actually going to be helpful in the situation where they can actually add stuff to the <coughs> And so how do you think we determine what makes someone helpful? What makes someone helpful? Well, in that situation, it would probably be their knowledge of the food, the playing field that we know they to, and all the other situations where it's an economic situation. It's like, are you actually going to work or are you still work off the welfare system? All right. So they need to have some sort of utility, some skill set that makes them valuable. So then we definitely shouldn't let any children or elderly into the boat, right? <laughs> this is all an ethical question, right? But what we're getting at here is the idea that there's never going to be a fair selection process, right, for who comes in the boat and who doesn't. Right? So there's a problem even with the idea of allowing some people in, right? which is that whatever mechanism we use to determine that, it will always be unfair to some, right? and probably unfair to most. So then you can guess what's the third option? Be charitable to none. And what happens if we are, don't let anyone in the boat? They drown, but <coughs> we survive. Okay? So we survive and they die. Now I'd like to give you all a moment to chat with someone next to you, and I would like you to tell me which of these three options do you think is the correct moral decision and why. So take a couple minutes to talk to someone nearby. Option one, two, or three. <laughs> to hold on to what you thought was the right decision and why. And I want you to see if you agree with that by the end of this talk, OK? <laughs> All right. So we're going to start off with the option that Garrett Hardin thought was the correct one. And I kind of gave you a hint. Which one does Garrett Hardin think? Three. Number three, OK? So Hardin thinks option three, which is where we are charitable to none, right? 
in the water, meaning that we survive and they do not, is the morally correct choice. Now the question, of course, in philosophy is why? Right? <laughs> right? Why is that the right choice? And so he's going to give us a series of explanations. The first one has to do with an idea of the tragedy of the commons. Have any of you ever heard of this before? Tragedy of the commons? Would one of you mind explaining to us what it is? taking out. so it would count as a common resource. Now, the idea is that in the tragedy of the commons, it is actually rational for every individual to exploit and overfish that lake, right? But the uh, problem is, is that, right, it's not really so bad if I do it, but what happens when we all do it? Overfish, right? There's not going to be any fish left in this lake if we all act that, that way. But the idea is that it is still rational for me as an individual to act. So the tragedy of the commons brings up this really interesting problem where the idea is that if we're sharing resources, it's actually rational for us to assume that everyone will take too much, right? We will all take more than our fair share, right? Because we're making that decision based on ourselves. We're not making it based on what we assume other people are going to do, right? So they'll always take more than they need, which ends up being harmful to the shared resources, right? And so the traditional solution to this is privatization of some kind, right? We need to make sure that someone owns these resources so that they can regulate how they are used and how they are distributed, right? So the idea is that, right, if we were to let everybody onto the boat or even some people onto the boat, right, can we assume under this notion that everyone will just take enough to survive? No, the idea is that people will always take more than they need to survive, right? And again, the example of the way we use resources in a developed nation is a good example of that, right? We all own far more clothes than we need, right? We all have way more food in our house than we need. We have way more shoes than we need, right? Make way more things. We have access to, we use probably much more water than we need, right? More electricity, right? So we're already doing this, right? We think it's rational for us to do this, right? But the idea is that when everybody does it, that's when the tragedy. Okay? So we don't want the tragedy of the commons to occur in the boat, right? which is the first reason Hardin gives to think that we shouldn't allow anyone into the boat. Right? We can already assume that the people in the developed nations are going to be taking more than their fair share. Okay. The next answer is something, or reason, is uh, called the ratchet effect. Okay? If we are going to try to save people who are already drowning, Hardin says that this is akin to us going against a natural process, right? In nature, there are mechanisms in place with, which prevent overpopulation, right? There's only a certain amount of resources, so if a certain species ends up overpopulating, they're just going to die off naturally, right? Because there's not enough resources for them to survive. So the idea is that if we are saving people from the water, we are interfering in a natural process that would help curb overpopulation. And if we let everybody into the boat, well, they're not just going to be there themselves, then they're going to have children, and we're going to have even more people that we have to take care of, right? So the idea is that this creates a, what's called a, it just gets worse and worse and worse, right, as time goes on. If we just keep allowing everyone to enter the boat and live like we do, right, not only do we have to worry about the resources that they're going to require, but then also when they have children and their children have children, and so on and so forth. Right? And so the idea is that the quality of life for everyone would keep declining drastically and drastically. The next one is related to this, right? the impact that it has on the environment. Right? So the idea is that 
we're not even sure if we can take care of all the people we have now without harming the environment, right? We haven't been doing a very good job so far of taking care of the humans who are already here without hurting the environment. And so if we were to try to allow everyone to live like we do, right, then that would also not just harm the environment further, but also possibly reduce the number of resources available to future generations, right? You might want to think of like a Mad Max situation, right, like water wars. Right? The way we are acting now is going to have impact right, and consequences for those who come after us. All right, the next one is about immigration specifically. Right? So typically, right, we might think that, well, allowing people into the boat, if this is supposed to be a metaphor right, for an economy, well, what happens when we allow immigrants in? Well, developed nations tend to benefit from immigration right, for a lot of reasons. But one that Hardin points out is the fact that this often involves right, the exploitation of labor. Right? So we're able to pay immigrants less right, for the same work because they don't have the same protections right, as citizens. And so that's sort of a benefit. Right? That might be a reason to let some people onto the boat. But again, right, what about future generations? Right? And you hear this rhetoric being used all the time. Right? It's not just about allowing people into the country now. They're going to have more children, right? And then we have to take care of them, and so on and so forth. We also have to worry about that second option, right? If we're taking care of people in the water, or even some people, we also have to think about who we're not helping, right? So if we are interested in helping those in developed nations, someone could say, well, you're missing your obligation to the people who need help here and now, right? So where do we draw the line in who we're helping, right? Who we're giving aid to? Shouldn't we first take care of indigenous populations here in America, right? Who have been exploited and who don't have, right? The same quality of life as they ought to? Or maybe we need to worry about other impoverished citizens, right? We need to worry about the people here before we worry about taking care of people <coughs> in other parts of the world. All right, so any questions about Harden or his reasons for defending option number three before we move on to the critique. No? All right, so the critique comes from uh, Murdoch and Oten. And just to review, right, Harden is claiming that if we were to let everyone into the boat, everybody dies, including us. Right? It's not just that they die, everybody dies. Murdoch and Oten, though, are saying that there are some big problems with the metaphor, the lifeboat metaphor that he's given us. And because he set up the metaphor in a problematic way, it's causing us to arrive at the wrong conclusion, right? So he's, they're obviously going to say option three is not the right option, right, to choose. It's not the morally permissible one. Nevertheless, the morally obligatory one. All right, so they're going to talk to us about some problems with the metaphor itself. The first one is this. The metaphor that, as Hardin has presented it, tends to ignore the ways in which the economies of developed nations are interconnected to economies in developing nations. Right? Specifically, right, the poverty of poor nations is at least partly a consequence of the action of wealthier nations. Can anyone think of an example, maybe involving the United States, in which our actions abroad have at least partly contributed to the uh, economic difficulty that that country has country faced? <laughs> Excellent. Can you um, give us some, uh, elaborate a little bit? Um, it's becoming such a tourist country, state, that the native residents are being pushed out further in and it's impossible for them to live there and it uh, becomes a very split economy between upper class and very good, right? So we're seeing a, a, an income uh, quality or a, a quality gap, right, in income, as well as probably the original sort of colonization of Hawaii, right, bringing it into the United States and the damage that was done there, right? So the idea is that you come in, you maybe disrupt the power structure that as it is, then everything collapses. It's like, oh, you need us, right? Look at how messed up your situation is, right? But the idea is that well, we contributed, right, to some to that. Good. Can we think of any other examples? I would think like the western horn of Africa where there's diamonds and stuff like that. So you got early 
colonization from Europeans and stuff that basically wiped out a lot of those resources and left them kind of disheveled without the ability to, I guess, become a prosperous nation, exactly. a prosperous region because the resources have been kind of taken away from them. Exactly, right? We've, for lack of a better word, stolen, right? We have stolen those resources. We have stolen, we have built our wealth on the backs, right, of those from other nations, right, and taken those resources and claimed them as our own, right? Question or contribution? Drugs. Care to elaborate on drugs? So we, we look at central, parts of Central and South America, right, and we make all these judgments, right, about how corrupt, right, their economies are and all of these uh, drug cartels and, right, but the idea is that, again, supply and demand, right, they're producing those things because who's buying them? Americans, right? For those of you who didn't hear it, it was absolutely right that Americans are the top consumer, right, of narcotics from Central and South America. Right? So the idea is that they wouldn't be producing those things if we weren't demanding them, right? if we weren't buying them. So we don't just get to point and say, well, look how terrible that structure is. right? The idea is that we play a hand in that. But they're also getting a big boost to their economy that wouldn't be there because of those illicit narcotics. It's not like we're coming in and taking... Well, so here's the thing about developing nations. If you remember that last condition, right? developed wow. nations tend to have less political corruption. So even though we could argue, well, look, yeah, supply and demand. We are demanding a product. You are supplying it. You are getting the wealth from that. But who is actually getting the wealth? The top. The top, right? So that, that wealth is not being distributed, right, in the way that we would typically understand from a capitalist perspective. Yeah, good. Okay. Another point uh, that Murdoch and Oak make is that we also need to recognize that the way we're living in the lifeboat, right, not everyone has to live that way, right? We don't need to make our decision about the well-being of present or even future generations based on our standard of living, right? The idea is that we could actually perhaps all survive if everyone in the lifeboat were willing to consume less, right? So it might be true that not everyone could be in the lifeboat and consume resources the way that 10% did, but if that 10% started to consume less, right, lowered our standard of living a little bit, then there are absolutely enough resources, right, for everyone to be included in the lifeboat, right? So again, it's not just a matter of maintaining the standard of living we are used to, but maybe adjusting that in order to allow everyone to survive. Okay, the next one is about what sort of vulnerabilities developed nations might face when other countries are struggling. Right? with the basic survival needs of their citizens. We know that as people struggle more for their basic survival needs, criminal activity increases. Right? We know this. And so the idea is that not only does that sort of um, instability uh, with regard to safety impact those nations, it impacts the world. Right? One nation not being safe doesn't just mean that that one part of the planet is not safe. Right? It makes the whole world unsafe. Okay? I mean, we can talk about right, various um, relationships to uh, motivations for terrorist acts. Right? It's not just out of nowhere right, that the United States and parts of the Western world have been targeted right, by various terrorist actors. The idea is that they see us, and not completely inaccurately, as responsible for the instability in their own country. Right? The United States had played a role, historically, Right? in creating power vacuums right? in those regions that allowed for that sort of instability. And so that makes the developed nation also vulnerable right? in that way. So the idea is that this vulnerability right, of having other people not be well off right, is an additional incentive for developed nations to address inequality, even if you aren't responsible for it. Right? Even imagine a situation in which you had no hand, right, your country had absolutely no hand in the instability of another nation, it still might be to your benefit to help them get things settled, right? Because again, now we're facing refugee crises, 
where the instability in other nations, right, is causing people to flee to other parts of the world. And so we can't just say, well, you know, the idea here is that you can't just say, no, 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 you can't come in, right? And just expect someone else to take care of the problem. If developed nations were to do more to help those people where they are from, we wouldn't have these crises to begin with. Additionally, you might have noticed that with Garrett Hardin's reasons in his support for option three, the big part of it presumed that if we allow people into the boat, that they will just continue to reproduce at higher and higher rates. And so what this assumes is that the more resources someone has, the more children they will have. Do we think that this is accurate? No, Emma, I see you're shaking your head. What, what do we actually think the relationship is like between economic stability and reproductive or reproduction rates? So Hardin makes a really um, just objectively inaccurate presumption about the relationship between economic stability and birth rates, right? So you can see I have a little graph here, right? You can see that over time in developed countries, birth rates have actually leveled out and now are actually in decline in a lot of developed countries, right? So birth, rate, birth rates are actually declining. Whereas in developing countries, right, we can see that as economic instability has increased, birth rates have increased. So what this means is that there's actually some evidence to reverse this, that social and economic development actually will help us curb population, right? So if the worry is that, well, there's too many people now, but 90% of those people are in developing nations, right, or not as well off as they could be, well, then by giving them the resources they need, we might actually lessen the population over time, right? So you don't have to worry about it just continuing to exponentially grow. And we know this is especially true when we give women access to education, right? Job opportunities, right? That allow them financial independence, right? Family planning services. These are all part of that picture. And then the final critique has to do with this notion of the commons, right? So if we recall, the commons is this sort of unowned resource, right? That according to Hardin, if all of us take a little bit, we'll end up taking too much which will result in this tragedy, right? Where we will have totally exploited the resource. And who can remember what Hardin's solution to the tragedy of the commons was? Not just his, but what most people think is the solution. What do we do to prevent the tragedy of the commons? Regulate it from like Very good, regulate it through privatization, right? So someone needs to own it, right? And then we need to regulate it, right? So the problem with this is not that what we're talking about is not a common resource, the problem is in assuming that the best or only solution is privatization, right? So the problem is that rather than privatizing the commons, right, which gives a small group of people or even perhaps one person, right, ownership over a resource, why not have something like communal ownership, right, over a resource? And even if we did use privatization with some regulation, how's that working for us now in the world? Are we through the privatization of land and resources, have we curbed the exploitation of those resources? No. Absolutely not, <laughs> right? So the idea is that we need to maybe revisit our solutions, right, to this notion of a common resource in that it maybe is not something that should just be owned by one nation or one person, but something that is seen as a communal resource, right? And then we need heavier regulations, right, than what we see today. Okay, so um, I, I'm glad that we finished early, so we have lots of time for questions, but I want to first thank you for coming. I want to encourage you to cons continue to consider what obligations you might to have towards other people, and you perhaps want to explore this in taking a philosophy class, like the number that we're offering next year. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you.
letting none of them in. What do we think? Yeah. I'm sorry? Well, hold on. Let's, let's keep on, on track with the question that we were just asking. So is there a potential third option? Yeah. Yeah, we throw off the worst offenders from our vote. <laughs> <laughs> Good, right? So there might be, again, a question of what we need to do with the people in the vote first, right? Instead of just putting the onus on what we need to do for others. Good, which is, again, perhaps maybe we need to let fewer people, or we need to have fewer people on our vote, right? The best people. Something like this, or we need to have uh, a way of reducing the sort of the number of resources that they consume, right, in order to do this. Excellent, right? So again, maybe it's not a matter a matter of letting them in the boat or not, but again, contributing to creating stability in their nation. Very good. sorts of questions about what the best way is to help people in the water, right? Um, often we think that it's just giving them things, right? When in reality, the best way to stimulate other economies is by giving them cash, <laughs> right? So that they're not reliant upon us, right, for all of their material things. They can start manufacturing and producing them in their own countries. And again, right, we know that economic stability grows when you let women start business. Right, that that ends up having the greatest contribution. I'm going to come to Chris, and I'll come back to you. What do you think is the reason that um, the Western society is predominantly on the top as far as economic values, and why are people much more here? Like, what's the differences? What's the? I mean, it can't all just be that we're taken from other countries. Like, where are other Colonialism. Yeah. That is exactly what it is. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I mean, in a much more robust way, right? It doesn't happen in the same way today that it used to, but yes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But again, th that's the thing, is making sure that the resources get to the right people, right? But there also needs to come a time when we need to perhaps be less paternalistic over the people in the water, right? Like, who are we to tell you how to spend that money? We are maybe not the best moral authorities in that regard, right? Um, people who aren't homeless probably spend lots of money on drugs and alcohol, but we don't blame them for doing that because they're not homeless, <laughs> right? So we should be careful about how confident we are in dictating, right, how other people make their life choices, right, especially when we ourselves have not proven ourselves to be um, the experts in that arena. Yeah. Uh, one thing this made me think of was the phrase, uh, teach a man to fish and we'll eat for a day, teach, teach a man to fish and we'll eat for a life. Exactly, I was thinking of that same thing, right, that's the exact idea, right, is that perhaps the best way to help is not just to give them resources that we have, right, but to help them develop the skills and the infrastructure, right, so that they can do it themselves. Absolutely. Uh, for the lifeboat option, it seems to me that it's less uh, free to screen option and more of a sector of the option that the potential to have free to screen. And so, yeah, it could be all or none, right? Yeah. And then some is definitely going to be, yeah, the middle spectrum, right? And then it's about how much. But again, we might ask whether or not Hardin is right. Is there ever going to be a fair way to determine, right, how, which people to let in, how much, and that sort of thing. And his claim is that there won't ever be a just way of doing that. But maybe we could try to imagine, right, a just way of doing that. But again, we want to be careful that we're not making those decisions based on things that are disguised as utility and merit, but really end up having very uh, racialized, discriminatory enactments. Right? Like preferring people who speak English. <laughs> 
so this is a problem that is often uh, framed, I think, typically as like the prisoner's dilemma, right? So the idea is that um, when you are not the only person or group contributing to a problem, it makes it difficult to incentivize changing your behavior if everyone doesn't change their behavior, right? So the idea is, yeah, we are one of the top three nations that contribute to climate change. Anyone know what the other two countries are? China and India, right? Um, now, China and India are doing things, right? Well, like, there's, there's just something out in the news where China is actually completely avoiding the contract between these two Oh, damn, see, yeah, this is the part of the problem, right? So we entered into the, the Paris Accord, right? The United States backed out, which de-incentivizes, right, the other nations from keeping their contribution, because what good is that gonna do if they're spending all this money to change their infrastructure when one of the other top three contributors to climate change is not gonna do anything, right? And it's in fact probably emitting more carbon now than it was before the agreement, right? So there absolutely is a question there. Now, there's also a question about at what level these obligations occur, right? Do they occur on the level of the government, corporations, or individuals? Now, for the sake of this talk, let's just focus on you because you have control over you, <laughs> right? While the little things that individuals do might not seem like a lot, again, when we all do them, right, it ends up having a really big impact. And so this is something that, um, again, with the carbon footprint calculator, right, I urge you to go on there. Uh, there are lots of them online. Figure out how much carbon you are emitting into the world, right? See different ways in which if you adjust some of the measurements, see if you can bring it down a little bit. Um, and you'll be surprised to see that, that there's actually a large impact even a single individual can make. Um, it's easiest to measure with things like uh, the impact on animals. So I think the last numbers I saw were that if you stop eating meat, you will save how many animals a year? No, it's like closer to 100. 100 animals per year you will save, right? That's not nothing, right? Especially when you consider the rest of your lifetime. Right? And so if we think about the carbon emissions that come from the animals we eat, right, especially cattle, right, which is the largest <laughs> industry that contributes to climate change, that is a huge impact. Right? Especially because when the market starts to change, the companies have to change. I mean, we have vegan burgers at, what is it, Carl's Jr. now or Jack in the Box? Which one? Burger, Burger King. King. Sorry, I wasn't, right, wasn't even close. Right? <laughs> right? But like that, that is, it's not because Burger King all of a sudden had a crisis of conscience. Right? It's because people are demanding alternatives. Right? So we are, our individual purchasing power can have a bigger impact than we often like to think that it does. Yeah, good. Um, isn't the boat sinking? Yeah. <laughs> yes. So maybe just to be fair to Harden for just a moment, um, and I'm not, I would think there are really, really problematic aspects to the metaphor that he uses. Sense, I mean, we might say, you know, these, these carbon emission calculations, these other solutions that people have put forward, while well intentioned, at the end of the day, it's rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. Right? So, I mean, maybe part of the solution might need to be not bringing people into the world. I don't know your answer. <laughs> There is a question of whether or not, a moral question that has come up in this environmental debate about whether or not we should be having children at all, right? Especially in developed nations because a child in a developed nation will use far more resources than 10 children in a developing nation, right? So perhaps part of our moral obligation to prevent the boat from continuing to sink, right, is to take care of the people who are already here before we bring more people into the into the world, right? Yeah. How are we doing on time? I did say I would try to end at 12.50 in case people had a one o'clock class, but if there are any other questions, I'd be happy to stick around and talk to you. Thank you all for coming. Have a wonderful day. <laughs>